The best old time radio from people you trust. The Radio Nostalgia Network, where the oldies are still young. In the dream, you are falling, lost in the listening distance, as dark locks in. By morning, Gage's temperature was normal and he was bright eyed and full of beans. In a few days, the virus cleared up completely. December was my busiest month yet at the university. As the semester funneled to a close, students crowded into the infirmary with coughs and colds, bronchitis, walking pneumonia, even broken bones from toboggan accidents. At last, the holiday began, and the four of us settled down for an old-fashioned Christmas. On Christmas Eve, after we'd finally got the kids to sleep, Rachel and I sat in the living room by the dying embers of the fire and wrapped the presents. <laughs> Remember last year? It seemed like everything we got them had to be assembled. I passed the ribbon. Right, up till four in the morning. <laughs> and by mid-afternoon, Ellie decided the boxes were more fun than the toys. <laughs> <laughs> there, last present. Apart from that bike, how are you doing with it, Chief? I just gotta tighten this and... Ta-da! Lewis? Yeah? What are these screws? Spares. You'd better hope so or she'll break her neck. You gonna wrap it? <laughs> Give me a break, <laughs> Lou. Stick a bow on it and stash it behind the couch. Go on, scat. Get out of here. Strange. That cat's got no grace anymore. When did he lose it? Same time he lost his balls? Maybe. Right. Bed. I'll give you an early present. Woman? That is mine by right. <laughs> <laughs> you wish. Merry Christmas. Now, that present I promised you. Hang on a second, I've got one for you. Hmm? I've been burning a hole in my pocket all night. Merry Christmas, Rachel. Lewis, well, what is it? Um, soap, shampoo, I forget exactly. Tiffany's? Oh. Well, do you like it? Is it a sapphire? That's what the guy told me. Oh, Lewis. Oh, it's so damn beautiful. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> Lewis, we can't Shh, afford... I've been socking money away all year. It's okay. How much was it? I'll never tell you, Rachel. <laughs> An army of Chinese torturers couldn't get it out of me, $6,000. 6000 Oh, Lewis, you're crazy. Here, turn around. Let me fasten it. Looks okay. Okay. I'm going to go up and look in the mirror. I want to preen. Mm. I'll put the cat out and lock up. When we make it, Lewis, I want to take everything off except this. Preen quickly. I'll be right up. Church. Church, come on, where are you? Merry Christmas to you. Oh, no, not another bird. You damn cat. Come on. Clear out of here. Yeah. Lewis. You coming up to bed? Uh, I'll be right there. I just gotta clean something up. On New Year's Eve, Judd and Norma came over. Norma seemed frail, as if she'd suddenly aged ten years. And as I watched her drinking Rachel's eggnog, I had a terrible foreboding. When the students came back after the holiday, the flu came with them. The infirmary was busy ten, twelve hours a day. I went home in the evenings utterly whacked, but happy. Then, in late January, in a week of blizzards and sub-zero temperatures, Norma died. Judd. Well, she's gone. Doc Merrill said it was probably a brain embolism. What does, what does that mean? It means she didn't suffer. I wouldn't mind going that way myself. <laughs> But not just yet, eh? <laughs> it's good, John. 
Everyone would have wanted you to cry. Probably been pissed off with you if you didn't. You should have seen her when she was 16, Lewis. Coming from church with a jacket unbuttoned, a shirt waist so clean and white, your eyes would have popped. Yeah. Get me a beer, will you? Have one yourself. Yeah, sure. A bit early in the day, I know, but... I'll tell you, Lewis, she was so damn beautiful, she could have made the devil swear off drinking. Well, thank God she never asked me to do it. <laughs> there you go. To Norma. May she have peace. And wherever she is, let there be no friggin' arthritis. So Judd sat in his kitchen and drank beer and reminisced. A stream of warm memories and anecdotes, colorful and clear, and sometimes arresting. And between telling stories of the past, Judd dealt with the present in a way I could only watch and admire. Could you have someone do her hair, please, Mr. Mortensen? She hadn't washed it since Saturday. A wash and set is all part of the service, Mr. Crandall. Would you like her cosmeticized? Lightly. She's dead. People know it. No need to tot her up. Uh, crackers, another couple of beers, Lou. This is going to take a while. Yeah. And I'd like the coffin closed during the funeral, but open in the chapel of rest. Judd was so composed, so courteous. I felt a great admiration for him then. And love. Yes. And love. That night, when Ellie came downstairs in her pajamas to be kissed, I knew she was going to ask me about Norma Crandall. I also knew Rachel was outside the door listening to what I had to say. Will Mrs. Crandall go to heaven? Um, well, I, I don't really know, honey. Hang on. Come here. People believe all sorts of things about what happens when we die. Some people think we go to heaven or to hell. Some think we're born all over again. Reincarnation? Reincarnation, yes, that's right. There's a whole heap of different ideas, Ellie, but no one really knows. People say they do, but what they mean is they believe because of faith. Do you know what faith is? I guess so. Well, here we are sitting in this armchair. You think it'll be here tomorrow? Yeah, sure. Well, you have faith in that. So do I. Faith is believing a thing will be. We don't know it'll be here. Some crazy chair burglar might break in <laughs> and steal it. Uh, really religious people say that having faith and knowing are the same thing, but I don't think so. Because when it comes to death, there are too many different ideas on the subject. What we know is this. When we die, either some part of us, our soul, I guess, somehow survives. Or not. If it does, all sorts of things are possible. If not, nada. The end. Which do you have faith in, Daddy? I used to think death was the end. But I guess I've changed my mind. I believe we go on. How? I don't know. But I think Mrs. Crandall is probably somewhere she can be happy. You have faith in that? I guess so. I also have faith in the fact that it's your bedtime like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> Night, Dad. Night, Ellie. Sleep tight. Daddy, do you think animals go on? Yes. I do. Remember my dream uh, about Church dying? I remember. If Church died now, Daddy, I could take it. I heard you talking to Ellie about... about death. You don't approve? No. Oh, no, it's not that, Lewis. I just... I get scared. Scared of dying? Not myself. Uh, I don't think about that. No, not anymore. As a kid, I thought about it a lot. I, I dreamed that monsters were coming to get me. They all look like my sister Zelda. Zelda? You don't talk about her much. <laughs> oh, Louis, you're sweet. I never talk about her. Well, I guess you've got your reasons. Yeah. She 
She died of meningitis, was it? Spinal meningitis. <clears throat> She was two years older than me, and she caught it, and she died in the back room like a, like a dirty secret. A, a dirty secret. Oh, baby. <laughs> don't. <laughs> no, don't stop me, Lewis. I've only got the strength to tell this once. It was really horrible. Yeah. Oh, worse than you could ever imagine. <gasps> We watched her deteriorate day by day. There was nothing anyone mm -hmm. could do except give her drugs for the pain. Oh, she was in pain all the time. Her body clenched like a fist. We knew, we knew she was going to die. And the, the truth is we wanted it. We wished her to die. Not, not just to end her suffering, but to, but to end ours. Because she was becoming a monster. Oh, God, Lewis, that sounds awful. Oh, Rachel, it doesn't. It does, it does. The victims of long illnesses often become demanding and unpleasant. They <laughs> spread their misery. It can't help it. Zelda would piss her bed. She'd say it was an accident, but you, you could see the glee in her eyes. And her, oh, God, her room stank of it. Mm. That and the drugs. Even now... <laughs> I wake up sometimes and I smell that room and for a moment I think, is Zelda dead yet? Oh, Rachel. By the end, none of us could remember her the way she used to be, not even my mother. She was just this foul, hateful, screaming thing in the back room. Our dirty secret. My parents were out when she... Oh. When she finally died. They left you alone? Oh, I mean, it was Passover. They went, they went to see friends. They weren't away long. How old were you? Eight. Jeez. I was downstairs. I, I was trying to read, but I, I couldn't because Zelda was mm. screaming, and I wanted it to stop. And, and then it did suddenly, and I, I knew I knew something was wrong. I ran up to her room and... Zelda was choking like... Rachel, that's uh, enough. No, enough. I'm explaining. I'm explaining why I can't go to Norma's funeral and why we had that stupid fight about that pet cemetery. Shh, come on now. That's all forgotten. No, not by me. I turned Zelda over and I, I thumped her back and she started to convulse. I, I, I knew she was dying and I thought, I thought they'll say I murdered her because, because, Lewis, my first thought when I saw her like that was, oh, good. Zelda's dying at last, and it's going to be over. <laughs> I saw her face go dark and her eyes bulge, and I, I backed away into a wall, and a, a picture fell down. It was, it was from one of the Oz books that Zelda liked, Oz the Great and mm. Terrible, only she couldn't say that. She, she said Oz the Great and Terrible, and it, it smashed, and I ran out of the room screaming, Zelda's dead, Zelda's dead, Zelda's dead. I was hiding in the garden when the neighbors came. They thought I was crying, but I wasn't crying, Lewis. I wasn't. I was laughing. I was laughing. Good. Good for you. <laughs> no, you don't mean that. I do. If I needed another reason to <laughs> really dislike your mother and father, I've got it now. You should have never been left alone with her, Rachel. Never. <laughs> Get you a volume. No, Lewis, you know I don't. Tonight you do. When the pill had taken hold, Rachel told me the rest. How for years she believed Zelda would seek revenge from beyond the grave. How she'd had nightmares. How she hadn't attended Zelda's funeral or any funeral since. I feel better, you know. Like I've just sicked up something that's been poisoning me for years. I guess you have. So you won't be mad at me if, if I'm ill on the day they bury Norma? No, I won't be mad. But can I take Ellie? Lewis. Okay. If, if you think it won't hurt her. Oh. 
death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God who gives us victory over death. Judd looks son, weird in that suit. Hashani. Will the pallbearers come forward? <clears throat> Excuse me. Daddy, where are you going? I'm one of the pallbearers, honey. I I'm going to help carry Norma out. Where will I find you? Go out on the steps. I'll meet you there. J just don't forget me. I won't. Daddy. What, babe? J don't drop her. <laughs> Lou? Coming to bed? Yeah, I'll just finish up here. How was Ellie tonight? She had a little cry. Mm. She said Norma made the best oatmeal cookies ever, and now she won't be making them anymore. Uh, she's right. <laughs> I promised to make some with her tomorrow. And that cheered her up. She's asleep now. Good. Lou, would you come up? I, j I know you're working, but... No, 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 no. Hang on just a second. I go. Time rolled by. Another spring. I remember the date. March 24th. The last really happy day of my life. The things that were to come, poised above us like a killing weight, were still over six weeks in the future. Days that are truly good, all the way through, are very rare. God in his infinite wisdom is a lot more generous in doling out pain. It was Saturday. Rachel and Ellie had gone to Bucksport with Judd, who liked the company, and I was home minding Gage. Kate had woken from his nap, scratchy and out of sorts. I tried to amuse him without success. When I heard the wind gusting around the house and suddenly remembered the kite I'd bought on a whim a few weeks before. Oh, Daddy! Hey, how about that? Got it up first shot. Flying it! Flying higher! Flying yeah. higher! Yeah! Woo! Yeah. <laughs> The kite soared into the blue. As it rose higher, 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 I felt myself go up, go into it, until I was staring down on the world, as cartographers must see it in their dreams. The field was a rectangle, white and still after the snow. Below it, I could see the dark strip of the road, and beyond that, the river, cold gray band of steel. Gage? What? You're flying it now. You're at the controls, my man. It's your kite. Gage, flying it. Yeah, that's right. Pull the string. That's it. Hey, look at it swoop. Yay. Pull the string. It was a moment with Gage I never forgot. Just as I'd gone up into the kite, now I felt myself go down into my son until I was in Gage's tiny house, looking out of the windows that were his eyes, at a world that was huge and bright, where Vinton's field was as big as a prairie, and a kite soared miles above me. I love you, Gage. I love you, Daddy. And Gage, who now had less than two months to live, tugged at the string that was drumming in his fist and made the kite swoop and dive. In 
my opinion, in fact, in my experience, there's no limit to the horror the human mind can apprehend. When the nightmare grows dark enough, horror spawns horror. Coincidental evils beget other, deliberate ones until at last, darkness covers everything. The interesting question is how much of this can a man stand and stay sane? But I didn't think about any of this at the time, by which I mean at the time of my son's death. Gage William Creed. During those few days leading up to the funeral, I didn't think about anything much. I just replayed the accident in my head over and over. Gage, stop! Stay there! You must never run in the road. Never. You do that again and I swear I'll put you over my knee. You gave us such a fright. But that ain't how it was. Gage was too quick. Lewis was too far away. That old Orinco truck was too big, too fast. That damn road. That damn road. I made the arrangements for the funeral, like I had for Norma a few months before. Lewis came with me to pick out the coffin. The American Casket Company's Rosewood model, Eternal Rest. It's a beautiful casket. Yes. I'm afraid we only have the pink silk lining, Dr. Creed. It should be blue, of course. Doesn't matter, Mr. Mortensen. My wife and I have never made such distinctions. The morning before the funeral, I was minding Ellie in the Creed's kitchen, watching the poor kid push her mark around the Monopoly board. She held onto a photograph taken last winter, her pulling Gage on a sled, both of them laughing. Rachel was out of it that day, house coat buttoned wrong, hair a mess. Lewis looked okay in his dark suit and tie, but he was lost in shock. Steve Masterton, Lou's buddy from work, was there too, thank God. I told you before, Mr. Goldman, Rachel needs a little more time. More time. And maybe this afternoon, if the tranquilizers kick in... I son-in-laws behind this, keeping my daughter Mr. Away from Goldman, me. Rachel is my patient now, and I'm doing what I think is best for her. Sorry. Right now, she needs to be left alone. You schmuck! <sighs> Father-in-law from hell again. <sighs> How's it going, Mr. Crandall? Pretty terrible. Three and five. Boardwalk. Your throw, Ellie. I'm worried about Lewis. Could you have a word before he leaves for the funeral home? If I think Rachel can handle it, I'll, uh, I'll bring her in this afternoon. Uh huh. Mr. Crandall, stay with Ellie. I touched his jacket, Steve. What? I swear I did. But by then he couldn't stop, and the truck was going so Ooh, fast. Ooh, get a hold of yourself. Right. I, I don't think you've noticed, but Ellie isn't vocalizing. And Rachel's in such bad shock, she's I lost all sense of time. I didn't fall down when little kids run fast like that. They always Ooh, fall down. they need you now. Please, man. I can give your wife a shot, but... Oh, what a mess. What a damn mess. You gotta go now, Steve. I'll be late for the viewing. Yeah, viewing. That's what Mr. Mortensen called it. Not really a viewing, of course, because of the closed coffin. But if it was open, they'd all run screaming from the room. Oh, Lois, I'm so sorry. Such a Dear and sweet little boy. Missy, thank you for coming. It's an awful road, Lewis. That truck driver was going far too fast. I hope they put him in jail. Why would God take Gage? I don't know. Where's Rachel? Resting. She'll be along later. Thank God he didn't suffer, Lewis. 
At least it was quick. Oh yeah, it was quick all right. It took five seconds for that truck to drag Gage the length of a football field. As I ran after him, screaming his name. On the 25-yard line, there was his Red Sox cap. 50-yard line, one of his Spider-Man sneakers. 75-yard line, his sweater turned inside out. Then there was Gage. Lewis? Lewis? Lewis, are you all right? Uh, yeah. Fine. Fine, Missy. Uh, don't forget to sign the book for Rachel. Be well, Lewis. Missy hurried on down the aisle for the ritual examination of the coffin. Then the rest came, moving in a shuffling line. And I received them. Their handshakes, hugs, tears. Collar and sleeve of my jacket got quite damp. He's with the angels in his whole life ahead of us. God moves in mysterious ways. Thank God he didn't suffer. Mercifully, he didn't suffer. He didn't suffer. Didn't suffer. Didn't suffer. I was told it was merciful Gage hadn't suffered 32 times. God works in mysterious ways, 25. He's with the angels now a mere 12 times. By the time my parents-in-law appeared, I felt like a boxer at the end of a long, hard fight. I thought how old they looked and I decided it was time to let bygones be bygones. Erwin, Dory, I know things have been difficult between us, but let's put that behind us now. You're right, Lewis. Gage would have wanted Don't speak to him, Dory. Come on. Erwin, Dory, please. I warned Rachel about you. <laughs> Dr. Creed, telephone. How you doing? Coping. Is Rachel coming in? Yeah. She seems a little better. Uh, how about we meet for lunch? Sure, Steve. What's a good restaurant for halftime between funeral viewings? Hey, take it easy. Um, how about Benjamin's? Mm, Benjamin's sounds fine. Your mom and dad were in. I hardly spoke to them. Can I get another beer here, please? Coming right up. Steve? Uh, no thanks. I've had enough. I'm going to give his clothes to the Salvation Army. <sighs> Rachel. Now, there's a lot of wear on them yet. Someone will be glad of them. Except for the ones he was wearing. Of course they Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Lewis? Lewis, for pity's sake. It's okay, Rachel. It's okay. I sat there and watched Steve take my wife in his arms and hug her gently. I could see he was angry with me, and I knew what I ought to do, but I just couldn't comfort her. That afternoon, Rachel received the mourners while I sat in the front row near the coffin. I was so tired. My mind started to shut down. I knew something like this would happen. I said when she married you, Erwin, you'll have all the grief you can stand, I said to her, and more. Now look at this mess. Well, what are you talking I about? I told Rachel this is what it gets you, marrying against your father's wishes. No, not even you would you say that. You little fraud of a You're doctor. You're drunk, you stink you of whiskey. You my daughter into marriage, turned her into a scullery maid, and then let her son be run down on the highway like... Like a chip You said that to Rachel, you, you said let that? My grandson die a dirty death on a country road. You bastard! Oh, 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 Lewis, no, no, don't hit me. You're like a hit old man. All right, man. Erwin, let's just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. No! no. 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 <laughs> Gage's coffin fell on its lid, so it didn't actually open and spill out his sad, hurt remains. We were spared that at least. Sitting there on the floor, bleeding onto the broken vases and crushed flowers, I began to weep. Beside me, Erwin Goldman was weeping too. Rachel was led out by her mother, still screaming. Later, she became very quiet. When I got her home, I sedated her and put her to bed. Try to sleep now. 
I'm sorry, Rachel. I'd give anything in the world for that not to have happened. Doesn't matter. You'll put Ellie to bed? Of course. How bad are you? Pretty bad, Louis. Pretty damn terrible. You don't want to sleep with Mommy tonight? No. You sure? Yeah, she steals the covers. I want you to know, Ellie, that if we keep on loving each other, we can get through this. I'm going to wish really hard. I'm going to pray to God for Gage to come back. Come on, Ellie. God doesn't bring people... God can bring Gage back if he wants to. God can do anything. God doesn't do things like that. He does so. In Sunday school, the teacher told us about this guy, Lazarus. He was dead, and Jesus brought him back to life. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Ellie, that's just... That was a long time ago. I'm going to keep things ready for Gage. I'm going to carry his picture and sit in his chair and, you know, get things ready. <laughs> in case. It makes a kind of crazed sense. Keep the lines open. Keep Gage in the hot 100. Remember when Gage did this or that? Yeah, good old Gage. What a kid. Because a day will come, Ellie, maybe soon, when you'll forget to carry his picture. And I'll see it lying in this empty room while you ride your bike or watch television or go out to play with a friend. When Gage becomes something that happened once, a blast from the past. Ellie, don't cry anymore. This isn't forever. Ellie fell asleep before her tears stopped. I left her bedroom and stood at the head of the stairs. I knew what I needed. I needed to get drunk. I got nothing for you. Go kill a bird. You don't even eat them, do you? Just killing them is enough for you. Uh, to my son. My late son, Gage William Creed, who might have been an artist or an Olympic swimmer, that goddamn president of the United States. Hey, Frankencat, get lost! Has anyone ever buried a person up there? Louis, no! Whoever would! When are you gonna do it, Louis, my man? When are you going to take Gage up to the woods? Never. You must not go beyond this, no matter how much you feel the need. Makes perfect sense. Gage was killed on the road just like Church. Now Church has come back. Not right, he's not... What, Ellie? Church smells funny. He's not Church anymore. Okay, he's a bit ripe. He kills a few birds. <laughs> you birds, jeez. Ellie still loves him. He's still part of the family. No, I won't go down that road. That's insanity. There is more power here than you can understand. It is old and always restless. Remember this. God can do anything. In Sunday school, the teacher told us about this guy, Lazarus. He was dead, and Jesus brought him back to life. Yeah, Lou. But would it work? Can I come inside, Louis? Tell you what, John. It's very late, and I've just drunk a pile of beer. Yeah, I, I can smell it. You gonna let me in or not? Well, since you put it like that, Hey, you're in luck. Still a few left. Right. Thanks. Okay. What are you doing over here at quarter past midnight on the morning my son gets buried? You're a good friend, Judd, but this is pushing it. Sit down, Louis. Tell me you're not thinking of taking him up there. 
to the Micmac burying ground. I wasn't thinking about anything but going to bed. How far does the influence of that place extend, you know? Chad, I really don't I see... don't, and I've lived my whole life in this patch of the world. That place was holy to the Micmacs, but not in a good way. Stanny B told me that, so did my dad. That's why I came over here tonight to tell you about Timmy Baderman. Who's Timmy Baderman? Timmy was one of 20 or so Ludlow boys, went to fight Hitler in 42. Came back in a box with old glory on top in 43. His daddy, Bill Baderman, went crazy when he got the telegram. Then he quieted right down. He knew about the Micmac burying ground, see? Why didn't you tell me this before, Judd? After we, after we did the cat. You didn't need to know then, now you do. I knew I'd got to talk to you about this when Mortensen down to the funeral home told me you'd ordered a grave liner instead of a ceiling vault. You've been snooping on me, Judd. I'm sorry for that. You once told me your uncle was an undertaker, said you worked for him one so summer. So what? So you know, it takes a crane and a gang of navvies to open a ceiling vault, but a grave liner, one guy with a pick and shovel could do it, if he was determined. Judd, it's late. I'm drunk and my heart aches. If you have to tell me a story, then tell it. Just get it over with. Timmy Baderman was shot dead on the road to Rome on July 15th, 1943. His body was shipped home two days later and put onto a mystery train with a dozen mystery others. Mystery train? That's what they called those funeral trains. This one went all over the state, Bangor, Derry, Orrington, finally Ludlow, where Bill Baderman was waiting. Timmy was buried in Pleasant View Cemetery two days later with full military honors. Half of Ludlow was there. That would be July 22nd. Four days after that, Marjorie Washburn, the mayor woman in those days, saw Timmy walking along the Peterson Road. Marge went straight back to the post office, tossed a bag of undelivered mail across George Anson's desk. Marge? What's the matter? You look as white as a bone. I don't want to talk about it. Are you sick? I said I don't want to talk about it. She didn't either. Not till 20 years had passed, and she was dying. I knew he was dead. Hell, I'd been to his funeral. Then there he was, walking, lurching up the Peterson Road, dead pale, eyes like raisins in bread dough, wearing an old army greatcoat, though it must have been 90 in the shade. I saw a ghost that day. Pretty soon, others saw Timmy. Mrs. Stratton was one. She had a house on the Peterson Road. She'd play her jazz records for you and throw a little party if you had a $10 bill that wasn't working too hard. She saw Timmy from her porch. He stood there at the edge of the road, hands dangling, chin pushed out. My heart was going like 60. I was too scared to move. Then he turned and looked at me. And his eyes, they were like dusty marbles. And he grinned. Still got your jazz records, Mrs. Stratton. Because I wouldn't mind cutting a rug with you. Maybe this very night. Mrs. Stratton went inside, didn't come out for a week by which time it was all over. You saw him, didn't you? Yeah, I saw him. What was he like? Ever see one of them zombie movies, Lewis? Where the creatures shamble along, dead eyes staring, sort of slow, clumsy? It's like that. He was, but he wasn't, because it was something behind those eyes, something nasty and sly. It wasn't quite thinking, and I don't believe it had much to do with Timmy Baderman. It was more like, like, like a radio signal coming from somewhere else. Anyhow, back and forth he went along that road, until at last a few of us got together. Me, George Anson, the postmaster, Hannibal Benson, our second selectman. We decided to go up to Bill Baderman's place and get that abomination taken care of. I'll never forget that night. It was hotter than hell. 
with the setting sun making the sky look like a bucket of guts. We drove over in Hannibal Benson's car. We were scared, Lois. When we got there, Hannibal knocked. No one answered, so we went round the back. And there they were. Bill Bainman was sitting on his stoop with a pitcher of beer. Timmy was in the yard, staring up at that blood-red sun. Bill, he was floating in his clothes, must have lost 40 pounds. His eyes were sunk. Lewis, he looked damned. Hey, I, I didn't hear your boys knock. That's a bare-faced lie. I knocked loud enough to wake, to wake up a deaf man. Bill, I heard your boy was killed over in Italy. Well, that was a mistake. The War Department don't think so. You see him standing right over there, don't you? So who'd you reckon was in that coffin you had buried out at Pleasant View? Damn, do I know. And damned if I care. The War Department... Let that damn War Department rot in hell. Timmy, Timmy come home the other day. He's shell-shocked or something. He's a little strange now, but he'll come around. Quit it, Bill. We all know you've been fooling around in the woods north of Route 15. You've caused yourself and this town a heap of trouble. When I got that telegram, life just ran out of me like piss down my leg. He was 18, all I had left of his dear mother, and now I got him back. So screw the Army and the War Department and the US of A, and screw you boys too. He's shaking. His mouth is going tick, tick, tick. There's sweat all over him. And that's when I realized he's crazy. You okay, Lou? I feel sick to my stomach. So what did you do about Timmy Baderman? Not a lot we could do. Hannibal said, God help you, Bill. We got ready to go. That's when Timmy came over. Hell, he even walked wrong, Louis, like, a, like an old, old man. And he stank. A black smell, like, like everything inside him was spoiled. You expected to see maggots squirming. Okay, stop, in. please, Judd. I've heard enough. That's it, you ain't. And I can't tell it as bad as it was. He was dead, Louis, but he was alive too, and, and he he knew things. Knew things? What sort of things? Timmy looked at Hannibal Benson, sort of grinned, showed his teeth anyway. Then. He, he leaned forward like he had a special secret to tell. H Hannibal couldn't move. He was like a like a, a, a raccoon caught in headlights. Got some news about your wife, Benson. Your young, sweet, innocent wife is screwing that man she works with down at the drugstore. No. No. <laughs> what do you think of that? What do you think of that? Shut up. Shut up or I'll knock you down, whatever you are. Jimmy, please. And know. you, old man Anderson, what? that grandson you set such store by is just willing you to die. You want to know what he calls you? Old wooden leg. No. What do you think of that? <laughs> but my, won't he spit when he finds all the money he's waiting for has been spent on gambling. Every red cent. What do you think of that? My God. <laughs> How did you... Timmy! Oh, my God. Stop it. You stop it now. Timmy wouldn't stop. He went on. Said something bad about me, too. He, he, he was raving by then, pouring out all that nastiness and bile. What we saw, it was pure evil, Lewis. We backed off at the... Then we ran. George had half fainted. We had to carry him. <sighs> Last I saw of Timmy Bateman, he was on that back porch, face all red in the setting sun, those terrible marks standing out, laughing and, and, and screeching. Cuckold! Beggar! Whore master! Cuckold! Beggar! Whore master! <laughs> Goodbye, gentlemen! Goodbye! Those things Timmy said, were they true? I don't rightly know. What about the thing Timmy Baderman said about you? It was true. Christ, it was true. I... 
I used to go to a whorehouse in Bangor sometimes. I'd, I'd just get the urge, the compulsion. Norma wouldn't have left me if she'd known, but something in her would have died forever. Something dear and sweet. Take it easy, John. Timmy told us the bad, only the bad. God knows, Lou, we've all got some of that in us. But there was good in those men, too. It showed us the bad because it was bad, and he knew we hated it. Timmy Bateman had been a nice, ordinary kid, but what we saw that night, that was a monster, Louis. And the Micmacs would have known what it was. And what's that? Something touched by the Wendigo. So how did it all come out? There was a fire at the Bateman place two nights later, burned flat. They both burned up? They burned, yeah. But they was dead beforehand. Timmy was shot twice in the chest with Bill Bateman's old colt, which they found in Bill's hand. Seemed like Bill killed his boy, spread the kerosene around, then flicked the match, ate the barrel of his forty-five. Oh, jeez. They were both well charred, but the county medical examiner said it looked like Timmy had been dead two or three weeks. The Micmacs didn't make that place the way it is, Lewis. It was there when they came here, maybe 2,000 years ago. Now they're gone, it's there still, and some they will be gone. The, 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 the evil will go on. So why'd you take me there, Judd? I was too weak to resist. The place has power. I'm scared it used me to get at you through your son. You see what I'm getting at, Lewis? You're saying the place knew Gage was gonna die? No, I'm saying the place might have made Gage die because I took you there. I'm saying I might have murdered your son, Lewis. No, I don't believe it. Well, the hour's late, Lewis. I've talked nine times more than I meant to. I doubt that. You've been very eloquent, Judd. We're burying Gage in Banger and in Banger he'll stay. I don't plan to go to the pet cemetery or beyond it ever again. Promise me, Lewis. Promise. For Gage's sake. I promise. For Gage's sake. <laughs> You must never, never run in the road, never. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy Seven years old already, I can hardly Gage. believe it. Uh, seems like only yesterday was in diapers. Okay, Gage, take a big breath. Take your starting positions. When did he get so tall? <laughs> State swimming mark. champion, scholarship to Johns Hopkins. <laughs> And through it all, he's still the same sweet Gage. And so, Gage William Creed, who celebrated his 19th birthday earlier this month, steps onto the podium to accept the first gold medal for cool. America of these Olympics. I feel so proud. Oh, Lewis, <laughs> I never thought. That afternoon, all those years ago, when I raced at a Renko truck for Gage's life, he was stepping up on that podium. No birthdays. No college. No Olympics. No gauge.
Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. <laughs> we buried Gage at two o'clock that afternoon with a short graveside service. My father-in-law stood opposite me across the grave, avoiding my eyes. He looked utterly lost and more like a wino than ever. Now let us all bow our heads for a moment of silent prayer. It takes a crane and a gang of navvies to open a ceiling vault, but a grave liner, one guy with a pick and shovel could do it, if he was determined. No, no, I won't think of that. Good service. You okay, Lewis? Just about. How are you, Rachel? I'm all right. Thank you, Chad. And how about you, my dear one? How are you getting along? I'm fine. Thank you, Mr. Crandall. Can I see that photo you got there, Ellie? Please? All right. Must have been darn hard work for you, pulling that sled. <laughs> I can see Gage liked it, though, didn't he? Yes, he did. Like Judd, please. No, Rachel. I'd pull him, and he'd laugh and laugh. Yeah. Then we'd go inside, and Mommy would fix us some cocoa. Remember that, Mommy? Yes. I bet that was a good time, all right. Here. You keep this safe. Your little brother may be dead now, Ellie, but you still got your good memories of him. Yes, I have. I love Gage, Mr. Crandall. I know you did, my dear. See you back at the house. At the gathering afterwards, Rachel broke down only once, and her mother was there to comfort her. Ellie did the rounds with a tray of canapes, the photo of Gage tucked firmly under her arm. That evening, clouds rolled in, and a strong west wind started to blow. Rachel was in the kitchen stacking the dishwasher. What are you looking for, Lou? Car keys. Take mine. Thanks. Where are you going? Thought I'd pick up a pizza. Didn't you eat earlier? I wasn't hungry then. I might try over to Banger. You want anything? 